Welcome, Tributes, and may the odds be ever in your favor. Before the games begin, I'd like to announce my first question and answer segment. At the end of the next games, I will be answering some questions. In the comment section of this video, you may comment any questions you'd like me to answer. All photo credits go to their respective owners. Pan Am today, Pan Am tomorrow, Pan Am forever. Here is the 107th Hunger Games. The previous year's games had capital citizens partying, happy with the amount of action, and happy with the year's victor, Nemoris Dalton. A few months after winning, Nemoris had moved to the capital for a few months, being invited to many capital parties, including the one where Maxima Liu, victor of the 79th games, had started a fist fight with Estelle von Rouge Harrington, victor of the 84th Hunger Games. Once the year had passed, Nemoris was chosen to conduct the reaping ceremonies. The sun's harsh rays had little effect on the youths of District 10, who were used to it by now. As for Nemoris Dalton, victor of the 106th Hunger Games, he had received a heat stroke while taking the long tour of the district, with him needing immediate treatment before the reapings. After he had been healed, the youths were impatient, after having been waiting for two hours. When he was at Reaping Square, ready perf to perform the ceremonies, he went quickly, not having time to give his speech. He was ushered by Mayor Brad Wick to the female reaping bull, where he pulled the name of 15-year-old Brisquette Chatteret. A short, tan girl with blonde curls gasped, bursting into tears. She received a few pats on the back as she made her way up to the platform. Once reaching the platform, she shook hands with Mayor Bradwick and Nemoris, facing the ground in sorrow as she did so. After taking a seat, a tear was seen to fall from her cheek. As Nemoris shoved his hand into the male reaping bowl, a scream of no brisket was heard from the crowd. The camera switched to show a tan and wrinkly older woman, who was revealed to be Brisquette's mother. Not wanting to cause any interruptions, her mother was shot dead, leading Brisquette to bawl her eyes out, making slight noise over the announcement of male tribute. Nemoris read the name of 18-year-old Lasso Farnham. A tall boy with a muscular frame and short blonde hair rolled his eyes, not very happy about having to be paired with such a weakling like Brisquette. Lasso continued forward, not giving much emotion until he reached the platform, where he took the microphone from Nemoris, giving a speech. I was fine with fighting in these games until I had to be paired with this weakling, he began, pointing at Brisquette, who started to cry more. Will someone please volunteer so I don't have to be partnered with her, Lasso said, rolling his eyes when no one answered. He tossed the microphone back to Nemoris, being led to his holding room. In the holding room of Brisquette, she sat lonely, not having anyone to visit her since her mother was killed. She cried to herself, letting all of her tears out before getting on the train. As for Lasso, he was visited by his girlfriend Belinda, who quickly broke up with him then, stating that she wouldn't want to be dating him while he died. This upset Lasso very much, who said many strings of swears directed to hurt her. Before, she was taken out of the room and he was escorted to the train. Once entering the train, both of the tributes were briefed by their mentor, Casco Astriana, victor of the 98th Hunger Games, who was disappointed in both of them for their antics at the reaping. Brisquette apologized for this while Lasso stared out the window, trying to ignore Casco. Casco went to the bar, already upset with how his tributes were acting. He came back with a large bottle of whiskey, drinking it while telling the tributes what he expected of them. Still draining the bottle contents, Casco played the clips of the 93rd Hunger Games, telling the pair to observe the tributes of Ten and how they had given up on life instead of sprinting away from the incoming tsunami, while Brisquette and Lasso paid attention to the clips. Casco brought out a large array of food before going to sleep. In the main carriage, once the food was brought out, the pair ate up while watching the clips, finishing them while Casco was still asleep. After that, Brisquette watched the Bunker Games, while Lasso went to the training carriage, using a sickle for the first time. After a long and draining day, Casco returned to the main carriage to eat and sent his tributes to sleep, knowing they would be exhausted upon waking early the next morning. As commanded, Brisquette went straight to sleep, not mentally prepared to arrive in the capital. As for Lasso, he stayed awake in his carriage, making slight conversation with a peacekeeper, whom kindly gave Lasso some idea of what the games this year would contain. At the crack of dawn, 
Lasso and Brisquette were woken, dressed, and glamoured to see the citizens waiting at the train station. When the trio had exited the train, they were met with cheers by some fans, many of whom were there to visit Casco instead of this year's embarrassing tributes. Casco led Brisquette and Lasso down the red carpet, letting them talk to few citizens, only the ones he said were rich, meaning they could sponsor the pair. After the walk down the carpet, the pair hopped into a limousine, not even saying goodbye to their fans. This was a move that would often bite tributes in the butt. Once in their apartment, Casco sent the tributes back to sleep, needing them to rest before the pair's stylist, Jorgen Cardu, would arrive. Jorgen had taken a six-year break from styling, joining back this year due to the lack of stylists, since Daria and Dulan quit after her tributes from the previous year, Yorka and Steer, had annoyed her so much. She was infuriated by the pair's behavior and lack of guidance by Madison, their mentor, who made Daria deal with the pair. That would be her last year styling. When Jorgen arrived in the apartment, Casco had his tributes ready to go, fully awake and dressed, waiting for him on the sofa. Instead of starting a conversation, he got straight to work, taking the tribute's measurements and starting off their costumes, which he announced to be representing a cattle. A few hours later, Jorgen showed the tributes a white and brown covered costume, which also had golden bells placed all over, leading the tributes to be moving bits of noise. Casco liked these costumes, thanking Jorgen and taking the pair to the avenue of the tributes, where the pair from Nine were getting ready. After the chaotic reaping of District 10, Nemoris Dalton, victor of the 106th Hunger Games, had finally reached District 9. He was given a tour constructed by Mayor Meadows, who made sure to keep Sun out of contact with his skin. After the boring show of wheat fields, he was taken to Reaping Square, not bothering to give a speech before pulling a name. For the female tribute, he read that of 17-year-old Sonoria Sanders. A girl, not pale or tan, quickly straightened her posture, walking to the aisle, allowing the cameras to get a better look at her. Tropica complimented her neat brown dress, but Rubius looked in shame at her messy golden locks. Sonoria quickly made her way to the platform, shaking hands with Nomoris, Tritica MacDonald, victor of the 100th Hunger Games, and Chief Javorski, victor of the 87th Hunger Games. After taking a seat, Sonoria stood into the fields behind Reaping Square, as Nomoris head to the male reaping bull, pulling a singular piece of paper from the bull's bottom. The name on the paper was announced to be that of 14-year-old Milo Mangelardi. A small boy, visible from the front of the enclosure, was seen to jump, fainting onto the boy next to him. Peacekeepers had to intervene with this, picking up the black-haired boy and dragging him to the platform. After this, Nomoris dismissed the youth, leading Sonoria to her holding room, while a peacekeeper carried Milo to his. In the holding room of Milo, he was surrounded by his parents, whom stared at the unconscious boy, muttering some words to each other before they were taken away. As for Sonoria, she was visited by her cousins, Speltine, Sephai, and Angkorn, who were siblings of Sonoria's fallen cousin, Panel. They gave her some advice that helped Panel and her ally, Sigmund, in their games. After a short visit and an even shorter hug, Sonoria was taken to the train. When Sonoria and Milo entered the train, both tributes conscious, they were greeted by their mentors, Tritica MacDonald, victor of the 100th Hunger Games, and Chief Javorski, victor of the 87th Hunger Games. Chief drank some lemonade while Tritica talked to the pair, telling them to find a water source and run away from the cornucopia when the games began. Both Milo and Sonoria were confused, not thinking they would talk about game strategies this early into the train ride. Regardless of their shock, they talked with Tritica, while Sheaf watched the pair to find out their physical strengths and weaknesses. After an hour-long conversation, Tritica played some capital TV and brought out some food, leaving the tributes alone to eat while Sheaf and her went to their private carriages, doing personal activity. The two had brief conversation, talking about their lives back in District 9. After a bland rest of the day, Sheaf came out, naked from the shirt down, telling the tributes to go to sleep. Alarmed by this sight, Milo and Sonoria went to their personal carriages, going to sleep to get ready for the next day. At seven in the morning, the train arrived in the capital, leaving the tributes and their mentor stuck in the main carriage, discussing what would be expected before the tributes would be let out. Once set into the large crowds, 
Mila was overwhelmed, yet managed to hold himself together. As for Sonoria, she talked with a few older citizens, telling them how she planned to fight in these games. After a 20-minute visit, Sheaf and Tritica led their tributes to the limousine, which escorted them to their apartment, where their stylist, Volumnia Crop, wait. Volumnia had waited with the pair's costumes ready, not needing measurements to take them. Tritica and Sheaf were happy that the costumes were ready, meaning they could have the day to themselves, not having to meet with Volumnia and discuss something every few minutes. The costumes she made were stunning. Both Sonoria and Milo would be dressed in denim overalls, with small sunflowers covered all over them, while on the top they would wear straw hats on their heads. The time they had before the parade was spent productively. Sheaf and Milo talked about sponsors, while Tritica and Sonoria talked about remaining calm, not freaking out, which could lead to her death. That night, Tritica and Sheaf walked with the pair to the Avenue of the Tributes, taking a good hour to get there. This was a good exercise that could get up their speed and amount of time walking without resting in the arena. The reapings in District 3 were longer than planned, due to their male tribute, Digiton, trying to escape from the reaping square after his name had been chosen. This led to a delay for the previous victor, Nemoris Dalton, to get to the district. In this district, how they dealt with volunteers was a system called the Reaping Games. How the Reaping Games would work was each volunteer from the district would be placed with three bracelets, one around their necks and the other around their wrists. All of the volunteers would then rip those bracelets off of each other until there was one male and one female left with bracelets on their bodies. The Reaping Arena, used every year since the 76th Hunger Games, had become more more of a swamp than the field it once was around the 86th Hunger Games. To improve the arena this year, Mayor Dalton, along with many other peacekeepers, placed new and larger rocks in this area, providing more hiding spots for the volunteers. Beating last year's record, 19 boys and 20 girls all volunteered, most of whom came from the leading training academy, the Dalton Elite, which had been around since before the 79th Hunger Games. The leader of the Dalton Elite, Rubius Dalton, victor of 86th Hunger Games, had been happy that all of the Dalton Elite members he handpicked had volunteered themselves. Among the male volunteers was 18-year-old Cyrus Thronsend, who was from the Dalton Elite. He eliminated four of his fellow opponents in the first ten minutes of the Reaping Games, throwing rocks at their opponents to knock them unconscious, then kneeling to them and ripping off every single one of their bracelets, then leaving them to be dispatched to safety. It had been a rule that rocks could be not used as weapons, but an exception was made this year by Mayor Dalton, who wanted to see how this would make the Reaping Games different. Although Cyrus was the only volunteer that knew this change in the rules, many other volunteers put up strong fights. When it was down to the final two volunteers, being Cyrus and Cray Heens, Cyrus soon found Cray, who was hiding behind a rather small rock towards the district Salt Lake. Cyrus threw a large rock at him from the far distance, hitting Cray in the head, although it barely caused any damage to him. Cray chased Cyrus, who stood still in the same area, not moving a muscle, which very confused Nemoris Dalton, victor of the 106th Hunger Games, who was watching. When Cray was about to run into Cyrus, he ducked, making Cray fly behind him, which led to Cray almost breaking his neck. While Cray lay barely conscious on the ground, pointing at his injured neck, Cyrus laughed at Cray, pulling off Cray's remaining bracelet. It was then announced that Cyrus Thronsend would be the male tribute in the 107th Hunger Games. Cyrus made no effort to hide his large smile as he was airlifted by the aircraft to the safety of Reaping Square. Out of the female volunteers was 18-year-old Eunia Umbridge, who was also from the Dalton Elite. When the Reaping Games began, Eunia ran behind her into the small section of trees with her friend, Bake Scale. When the pair were attacked by Clemino Steth, Bake and Eunia ripped off each of her remaining bracelets, which sent her to be dispatched from the arena. At the time, both Bake and Eunia were not planning to turn on each other, but they faced each other, looking at each other's remaining bracelets, which were three for Eunia and two for Bake, who accidentally tore hers off on a branch. At the time, Bake was predicting that Eunia would turn on her, so she pounced upon her chest, ripping off Eunia's neck bracelet. Eunia was shocked that Bake was doing this. Eunia pushed Bake to the down, to the ground before laying on her, ripping off her two remaining bracelets, which sent her to be dispatched out of the mud pit. When it, 
was down to just Eunia and Kenna Smith. They both walked to the center of the mud pit to spar off with the other. Kenna's neck bracelet was easily torn off by Eunia, who instantly jumped on Kenna's chest when she came close enough. As it was announced that Eunia Umbridge would be the female tribute for District 2 in the 107th Hunger Games, Kenna shouted that this was not fair and that they should have a rematch. She was quickly silenced by Eunia, who kicked Kenna against the head. Eunia and Cyrus were then bathed and groomed for their victor interviews, for their tribute interviews in Reaping Square. For the interview of Cyrus, Mayor Dalton complimented his dark and shiny suit as he came from the town hall to the chair in front of the Reaping Bulls. Cyrus was asked by Mayor Dalton how he had known this rule, that rocks were allowed, when no other contestant did. Cyrus answered Mayor Dalton by saying that he listened to Mayor Dalton's speeches unlike many other members of the district. Mayor Dalton interrupted this, thanking Cyrus for actually listening to his long speeches. Cyrus was soon asked by Mayor Dalton to perform his skills with a weapon, which he happily agreed to. Cyrus grabbed the available sword before going out into the field surrounding the Reaping Square and twirling it in various ways that greatly impressed many viewers, including Mayor Dalton, who told Cyrus that his skills since being in the Dalton Elite had greatly improved. For the next interview of Eunia, she wore a dazzling golden dress that shimmered in the sunlight as she waved to the spectating crowd, walking to her seat next to Mayor Dalton. Mayor Dalton told Eunia that many of the spectators who watched the reaping games with him in the Dalton Elite did not believe that she was strong enough to be a tribute for District 2. This shocked Eunia, who got up and walked to the array of weapons. She instructed Mayor Dalton to place four mannequins available in a circle, standing out in the grass. This was done as Eunia grabbed a blindfold and a spear. Eunia then took these two supplies to the center of the circle, before having Mayor Dalton test the blindfold, which he said he could not see through. Eunia then placed this blindfold over her eyes, and spun in multiple circles before throwing the spear. She threw the spear, and it went straight through one of the mannequin's chests. Her haters, who thought she was untalented, called this a lucky shot, until Eunia requested that two more spears be brought out to her. Eunia spun around again before throwing the spears at the same time, having one spear go through a mannequin's neck, while the other spear went through the same mannequin's head. This greatly impressed the whole crowd and Mayor Dalton, who cheered and applauded. Eunia bowed for her fans before she and Cyrus were taken to their holding rooms. Cyrus was visited by his parents and younger sister, who all congratulated him on winning the Reaping Games. His parents wished him the best of luck for the games before he was escorted by Nemoris to the train. Eunia was visited by her parents, who told her to be careful of Cyrus as he could be her biggest threat in the arena. She was wished the best of luck by her parents before she was taken to the train. Once the pair had entered the train, they were quickly congratulated by their mentor, Nemoris Dalton, victor of the 106th Hunger Games. Rubius Dalton, victor of the 86th Hunger Games, had been supposed to mentor Eunia, but he had to cancel on this, leaving Nomoris as the mentor for both tributes. As the pair took seats, Avox has reported Nomoris saying that he wanted a child who could fight in the games. Once taking their seats, Eunia asked if Nomoris would be mentoring both of the pair. Nomoris nodded, saying that Rubius had important duties to do with Saffron Harrington, Victor of the 102nd Hunger Games, who also had to skip mentoring for the year. Eunia continued to ask Nemoris questions, several of which he answered before telling her to be quiet for a second. Offended, Eunia stayed quiet and listened to what he had to say. I want you to train with your weapons while I watch the other reapings to record information for you. Nemoris then took the pair to the newly added training carriage so they could work on their weaponry skills for the rest of the train ride. Cyrus and Nemoris both dressed in armor before grabbing swords and beginning to fight. This confused Eunia, who was told by Nemoris that he was going to record reaping information for the pair. Eunia went over to the spear station and picked up this weapon, continuously throwing the spears at the bullseyes of two targets. For Cyrus and Nemoris' fight, Cyrus put up a strong fight, but he was beaten by his mentor Nemoris, who won 14-8. to 8. 
After their fight, Nemoris and Cyrus went to the spear station, where Eunia was improving her insane accuracy. While Cyrus worked on his spear accuracy, which was weak, Nemoris taught Eunia how to do a backhand spring and then throw a spear with great accuracy. Eunia worked on this for the next 10 minutes, until Nemoris gave them 15 minutes to glamour themselves before they arrived in the capital. When Nemoris entered the train, exited the train first, Eunia and Cyrus heard capital cheers for him due to his large amount of popularity after he had won. Following him, Cyrus was instructed to get off the train. Cyrus smiled as he received large amounts of cheers as he walked down. As Cyrus reached the end of the red carpet, one young lady complimented his large muscles and golden suit. To thank this lady, Cyrus carried her down the whole red carpet with many citizens cheering the woman's name, Carla, as she did so. When Eunia was told to exit the train, a massive amount of cheering was heard due to her great performance during her reaping interviews. A mixture of voices were then heard, with some people complimenting her golden dress, while others requested her to do a cool skill. Eunia looked over that and then nodded to Nemoris, who handed her a spear. A target was placed in front of the train by Nemoris, who also cleared the red carpet for Eunia to do her trick. Eunia came onto the red carpet, placing the spear to her right. She then did a backhand spring, spring, then threw the spear straight into the center of the bullseye, which created a huge round of applause. Eunia bowed before Nemoris took his tributes to the limousine that drove them to the accommodation quarters. Once the trio arrived in their apartment on the second floor of the accommodation quarters, they ate a luxurious capital dinner made by an Avox. After they finished eating, Nemoris made the call for the pair's stylist, Charmaine Patterson, to come to their room. Within the next ten minutes, Charmaine arrived in their apartment as Cyrus and Nemoris were in Cyrus's room, practicing with sword skills. Charmaine walked in on Eunia watching the reapings for District 1, laughing when the female tribute, Spear, had found out she won with Eunia saying this name was so original, Charmaine laughing at the stroke of sarcasm. Charmaine could tell that if Eunia won, they would be good friends, since they both shared a great sense of humor. She thought about this as she went to Cyrus's carriage to get the boys. Cyrus and Amoris were clearly frustrated that Charmaine had interrupted their fight, but neither of the boys were disrespectful to her about it. When they all gathered together in the main room, Charmaine went over a slideshow of all her ideas on District 2 costumes, telling the trio they should all agree on, the co on a costume. They all agreed on the same costume, which would be a white toga with a white headband, covered in crinkled gold foil for Eunia, and a red shirt, half of which being covered by a white toga, with the same headband as Eunia for Cyrus. While Charmaine created these costumes, Cyrus and Nemoris sword fought in Cyrus's room while Eunia offered to help create these costumes with Charmaine. Charmaine thanked this offer, but told Eunia that she could go work on her weapon skills, which is just what she did. Eunia grabbed her spear along with the target before going out into the dark balcony, practicing with her weaponry skills. Eunia threw her spears for over the next hour, evolving her great aim. Soon, Charmaine took a break from working on her costumes and came to visit Eunia. On the balcony, the weak microphone technology and the cameras could not pick up what the girls said to each other, although it led to Eunia laughing as Charmaine took her back inside the building, now allowing her to help finish the Paris Parade costumes. While the girls talked on the balcony, it was thought by them that the boys were still sword fighting, but instead, Nemoris helped Cyrus study for the games. It was reported then by an AFOX that Nemoris told Cyrus to barely trust Eunia. The boys soon went to the main carriage, stunned at the beautiful costumes Charmaine had created. The tribute parade took place the next evening. When Sonoria and Milo arrived at the Avenue of the Tributes, they were shocked to see all the other tributes' amazing costumes, making theirs look mediocre. They stayed calm, getting into their chariots as Tritica and Sheaf gave them some advice for the upcoming parade, stating how they could make themselves popular from the capital fans. As for Brisket and Lasso, they both stayed quiet, anger on their faces when Casco did not help them at all into changing into their costumes. 
but instead stared at them until the parade began. When Cyrus and Eunia were taken down to the line of chariots just minutes before the parade started, they saw the costumes of Spear and Leathero, both from one, whose costumes were just embarrassing after they annoyed their stylist so much she quit. Henceforth, their costumes were not fully completed. Cyrus and Eunia started laughing at Spear and Leathero when they made their way to their chariot, neither happy with Cyrus nor Eunia. A fight almost broke out between the girls when Spear stuck her middle finger up at Eunia. Eunia tried jumping out of her chariot to go fight Spear, but she was quickly stopped by Charmaine, who said, You'll regret it. This stopped Eunia from getting out of her chariot, and instead she smirked at Spear, as Horn of Plenty sounded and the chariots began to move. Sonoria and Milo's costumes were enjoyed, with the pair hugging halfway through the parade as Stritica had told them to, leading them to be more popular in the capital. Brisquette and Lasso's cool costumes were scanned over, with Tropica stating that this had been the first creation of Jorik and Cardu in a long time. The costumes were not loved, yet not hated. As Spear and Lev the Rose costumes were humiliated, many capital citizens enjoyed Eunia's white toga and golden foil headband, as well as Cyrus's red shirt and white toga. What made the pair even more famous in the capital was when Cyrus and Eunia shot their hands up together in a mixture of harmony and pride. They easily earned the title of Anderson Fashion's Best Dressed, which Cyrus and Eunia easily expected. As for the pair from Ten, they did awfully. The tribute soon went to sleep so they would be ready for the training that began the next morning. The previous year, the training center had been destroyed due to the accidental bombing around the center. In this case, instead of making a new one, the training center was switched back to the older one, where the training would take place from then on. As well as this, training time would be swapped back to two days, instead of one like it had been for the past six years. On the first out of the two mornings of training, Eunia and Cyrus were greeted by head of training Dalton, instead of him messing around with them like he did to many other tributes. Once they saw the training room, Cyrus quickly went to the sword fighting station where Leathero from 1 and Thick East from 7 were sword fighting at, while Eunia went straight to the spear station where Spear from 1 was. At first, Eunia and Spear ignored each other and worked with their respective weapon until Spear came to Eunia and started giving her false pieces of advice. Eunia easily ignored Spear and continued to throw her spear at the bullseye, showing more impressive skills than Spear, who said she was better than Eunia. This clearly frustrated Eunia, who decided to go to the sword fighting station where Leathero from one and Cyrus were being placed in armor. Eunia cheered for Cyrus as the fight began. Cyrus quickly swiped Leathero, who tried to duck but failed. When this fight started to end, almost half of the tributes and training staff were watching this close fight that was now tied. The fight ended with Cyrus winning 17 to 15 points. Leathero was clearly annoyed with Cyrus, who was now talking with many of the training staff. Only Eunia spotted Leathero whisper something inaudible to her to spear before pointing at Thick East from Seven, who was in the axe throwing station, using this weapon with good accuracy. As the pair approached Thick East, Eunia stood in the spear station, watching the three's every move. The trio's talk soon ended with Thick East nodding, then going over and whispering something to his district partner, Pama, who nodded her head. When Eunia told Cyrus about her suspicion of them making an alliance, Cyrus quickly stomped away to Palma from Seven, who was in the camouflage station. When Cyrus got to the station, Palma almost ran away, but she was stopped by Cyrus, who grabbed onto her and asked if she was making an alliance with the pair from One. Palma quickly shook her head, refusing to answer Cyrus. He then told Palma, I'll ask you one more time, are you making an alliance with the pair from One? Still keeping his firm grip on Palma. After Palma still refused to answer, Cyrus turned her upside down, then plopped Bing, her head in the brown paint. Palma screamed, and head of training Dalton quickly came over to see what the problem was. Once he saw what Cyrus had done, Rubius laughed, stating that what he'd done was funny. After this event, Palma was taken back to her apartment for the rest of the day. For the rest of the training day, Eunia spent her time alone in the spear station, where she had convinced Spear from one to not go. She was then taken back to her apartment along with Cyrus, who had been disappointed to be leaving this early. 
Once training had begun, Milo and Sonoria went to the survival station, working on projects separately. Sonoria ended up making a trap which would stick just about anything to it. As for Milo, he tried the toxicological part of the station, but he did not do well on learning the difference between toxic and non-toxic berries. For the whole first day of training, they alternated between this station and the camouflage station, not talking much as they went between the two. As for Brisquette, she tried teaching herself to swim alongside Calamari and Marsh, both from four, who were swimming back and forth throughout the large pool, impressing Bis Bis Brisquette very much. When Brisquette got the courage to try, she almost drowned, narrowly being saved by Marsh. Thank you, she gasped while trying to get breath. Marsh nodded his head, knowing she would be dead if it was not for him, since training master Dalton would not have grabbed her. Brisquette spent the rest of the day in the sewing station, working next to Tinsel from eight. As for Lasso, he spent the whole day in the sickle station, trying to gain some skill over this weapon, picking up the basics of using it very easily. Once the training time came to an end, the tributes were escorted to their apartments, resting before the next day of training. Bright and early the next morning, Eunia and Cyrus were happy to be the first tributes to arrive at the center, not having to be annoyed by Spear and Leathero. Once all the other tributes started to arrive, they saw Spear and Leathero, both from one, and Thickies and Palma, both from seven, together in the rope tying station. Once this group had realized Eunia and Cyrus had arrived, they all scrambled in different directions. Eunia went to the spear station along with Spear from one, while Cyrus went to the throwing knife station to improve his aim. He spent almost the whole training day at the station, which did improve his throwing knife aim greatly, enough from what the assessors said to be drastically. For the last hour of training, he sword fought with Leathero from one, whom he beat. A few minutes later in the Spear Station, when Spear tried to give Eunia false pieces of advice, Eunia chose to ignore Spear, which frustrated her and caused her to moan loudly. This annoyed Eunia, who continued to ignore Spear. Spear then moved Eunia's hands, which were about to release her spear, to right in front of her. This frustrated Eunia, who tried to turn her spear out of Spear's grip. What really frustrated Eunia was when Spear grabbed Eunia's spear and jammed it down into her big toe, with it not going deep or hurting her at all. Spear then continued to scream, She stabbed me with her spear! Spear showed head of training Dalton her small wound, and Dalton believed Spear. He then went over to Eunia, then smacking Eunia's face so hard, it started to become a dark shade of purple. He did not want to do this, but he was forced to by President Fling, whom told him that all issues needed to be solved properly, not favorably. Eunia was so annoyed with Spear, but she could not do anything back to Spear. She tried to save her rage for the arena, but she could not, which led to her taking it out on Spear during her training assessment. As for Cyrus, he spent the day in the store station, learning new fighting techniques. As for Milo, he spent the day in the camouflage station, being taught some basic st skills by license from Six. Sonoria spent the day working in the dagger station, learning some weaponry skills as Tritica suggested. Brisket and Lasso's day went uneventfully, both of these tributes slacking off for most of the training time. That night, the tributes training assessments took place. For the training assessments that night, Eunia was third to go, right after Leathero from one. When Eunia first entered the room for her assessment, she headed straight to a cart, carrying eight survival knives. She grabbed two of them, along with a spear and a mannequin walking to the back wall close to where the assessor spectated. She plopped all of her supplies on the floor before grabbing a paint marker from the camouflage station and wrote on the chest of the mannequin the name Spear. It was correctly guessed by head game maker Fling that by Spear she meant the female tribute from District 1 who was named Spear. Keeping in mind what Spear had done to Eunia earlier in the day, the assessors watched Eunia's assessment. Eunia then grabbed two of the survival knives, having a peacekeeper hold the mannequin on the wall. Eunia then stabbed one of the knives in each of the mannequin's shoulders, with the knives going completely through the shoulders and attaching the mannequin to the wall. The peacekeeper then walked away as Eunia went to one of the furthest distance available in the training center, then throwing the spear at various places on the mannequin's body that she named a lap before throwing them. 
This impressed the assessors greatly as Eunia hit every single place on the mannequin's body that she named. She did perfectly, until she said right eye, but hit the nose instead, which was still very impressive. When the assessors soon dismissed her, she continued to stay in the training center, throwing her spear at the mannequin. She soon had to be carried out by a peacekeeper 30 se seconds after her assessment time had ended. For the next assessment of Cyrus, he walked into the training center, all proud and confident, knowing that he would do well. He started out his assessment by grabbing a sword and twirling it at the center of the room, doing cool tricks that impressed every assessor. To end off his assessment, Cyrus grabbed exactly six throwing knives before going to one of the targets, throwing them with what assessors called great strength and fine accuracy. He confidently exited the training room, with him correctly guessing that his score would be high. For the assessment of Sonoria, she made some plant-based traps, as well as showing some skills with daggers, not receiving much compliments or attention from the game makers. As for Milo, he camouflaged himself into a prop tree, blending himself greatly into the area. After cleaning himself off, Milo tried his luck at the toxicology quiz, not doing well. The next called in was that of Brisquette. For her assessment, she tied a few ropes together, tiring herself by doing this. As she left, the game makers laughed at her weak display. Lasso performed with a sickle for his assessment. He swiped amazingly, showing some real strength and effort. The next morning, the assessment scores were revealed. Later the day before the interviews began, Tropica Melbourne announced the training scores. Rubius, Nomoris, Eunia, and Cyrus were all happy that the pair received the high training scores of 11. They started celebrating, but Nomoris told them to watch the rest of the scores to see if anyone else scored something high. High scores contain of Leathero from one who scored a 10, Spear from one who scored a 9, and Racine and Lasso, both Racine from 6 and Lasso from 10 who scored an 8. The lowest score this year were was received by Brisquette from 10 and Seedy from 11, who scored 2. As for the scores of Sonoria and Milo, they re received a 6 and a 4. In the evening, the interviews took place. Tropica's outfit that resembled a burning sun, in reference to the previous games, was greatly received by the crowd. For the very first interviews of Leathero and Spear, both from 1, they acted confident, thinking this would get Tropica to say good things about them to the crowd, but unfortunately for them, this did not happen. For Eunia, she dressed in a simple golden toga, leaving her shimmering black hair untouched. She answered Tropica's first question with great confidence, yet she seemed phased when Tropica asked her if anyone had left an awful impression on her. Eunia was tempted to say Spear and go on into detail on how she was planning to torture Spear in the arena but she simply said, you'll see, after seeing Nomoris shaking his head from the crowd. For Cyrus, he was dressed in a gold suit, having his black hair shaved for the interview. When his interview began, Tropica was clearly impressed with how massive Cyrus was in person and immediately complimented him on this, which received cheers from the crowd. Cyrus thanked Tropica before taking a seat in the palm chair. Tropica congratulated Cyrus on his high training score of 11, asking him how he had earned it. Cyrus simply said pure strength, which made Tropica let out a small giggle. His interview soon ended as a, dis as a success. Near the end of, end of the interviews, Sonoria was called to the stage. She came to the stage in a stunning brown dress that went well against her light skin. As she took the seat, Tropica asked if she had learned anything from the past games, especially with the fact that her cousin Panel had fought in the games a few years ago. Sonoria had remained calm, almost letting out a tear upon the mention of Panel, yet she managed to hold herself together. I have learned much from past games. Knowledge, I hope, will come to good use. This answer had, was given respectful applause, which the audience had not given for the past few interviews, which had been bland and boring. The rest of her interview was successful, garnering some applause as she walked off stage. As for Milo, he did well in his interview, slouching a little but answering all of Tropica's questions. When the interview of Brisquette came, she started to have a panic attack, worrying from the fact that she would be placed in front of a large audience. Regardless of her stress, she was dragged on stage, forcing her interview to take place while she was unprepared. Upon taking the seat next to her, Brisquette started sobbing, begging for anyone to take her out of the games. 
This act embarrassed Casco and Lasso, who watched as she did this for her whole interview time, soon being booed off stage. Lasso soon came to the stage, wearing a brown suit with brown boots and a cowboy hat, this outfit attracting the attention of many female admirers. He remained composed, unlike his district partner as Tropica started the interview. "'What do you think your girlfriend will think of you if you win?' Tropica asked, hearing the drama about him and his now ex-girlfriend Belinda. "'She will hate it, and will be embarrassed if I win,' be he began, "'and I will enjoy every moment of it.' This answer was proven popular due to the large amount of applause. The rest of his interview focused over his relationship with Belinda, which made Lasso feel uncomfortable. After this interview, C.D. from Eleven was called to the stage. Once Fran Gag from Zero headed off stage, head game maker Anastasia Fling was called out. She came out in a stunning white dress with dazzling silver heels. Tropica complimented her outfit as Fling took a seat. Many of the questions Tropica asked revolved around the arena, which Fling gave a single hint about. The arena shall be one with the winged creatures. The interview was ended on a high, Fling receiving kind applause before the tributes were taken to the pre-game feast. During the pre-game feast, Lasso and Casco talked with many sponsors, while Brisquette kept to herself, staying at a small corner of the room, not approached by anyone. As for Milo and Sonoria, they talked to a few sponsors, mainly staying at their table and talking with Sheaf and Tritica about the upcoming bloodbath. As for the tributes of two, they spent loads of time watching Palma and Thickies, both from seven, talk with Spear and Leathero, both from one, not happy that these two's, these two duos would be teaming in the games. Nemoris tried telling them to ignore this pair and that it would not matter in a week, but they did not listen, choosing to watch these four. Bright and early the next morning, the tributes were given a small breakfast before they were taken to the arena. When it came time for the tributes to go to their holding rooms, they were flown in a windowless hovercraft to underneath the arena. Before in their holding rooms, they were dressed in the simple black raincoat, a shirt of their district color, brown boots, and brown jeans. Cyrus was visited by his mentor, Nemoris. Nemoris started by telling Cyrus that she, he should always have an eye on Eunia. Cyrus did not seem to focus on this, and instead asked Nemoris what she, he should do if Eunia dies in the bloodbath. Nemoris told Cyrus that he should be fine on his own, but it would be helpful for him to have an ally. Cyrus nodded to Nemoris, thinking about if he really wanted a team with Eunia in the arena. Nemoris soon exited the holding room when the tube call sounded. Cyrus secured himself in his tube before he rose up into the arena. Since Cyrus was v being visited by Nemoris, Eunia was visited by her stylist, Charmaine. Charmaine told Eunia some smart strategies she had seen in past games, and encouraged Eunia to do one of them. A couple seconds before the tube call sounded, Eunia asked Charmaine if she should team with Cyrus, with Charmaine knowing that there was an alliance between the tributes of one and seven. Charmaine told Eunia, definitely, but always keep your eye on him. Eunia and Charmaine hugged as the tube call sounded, and Eunia rose into the arena. Sonoria was visited by her mentor, Tritica MacDonald. Tritica reassured Sonoria that everything would be fine, hugging her, whispering some ideas in her ears, reminding her to run away from the cornucopia. As for Milo, he was visited by Sheaf, who said that he needed to remain awake as long as he could, trying his best to not fall asleep, knowing this would be a problem for the boy who was known as a sleepyhead. Sheaf had a brief conversation with Milo, soon sending him off into the arena. Lasso was visited by Casco, who told him to get a sickle at the cornucopia, since he knew Lasso was good at this weapon. The two boys proceeded to chat, not at all talking about the upcoming games. As for Brisquette, she was left lonely in her holding room, n neither Jorgen or Casco wanting to visit such an embarrassment. She was all by herself as she rose into the arena. These games took place in an arena known as the Meadow Pasture. When the arena came into sight, Tropica was shocked by the beautiful sights, stating that this arena was the lar was the biggest there had been since the 100th Hunger Games. This arena was a large meadow, with the arena being covered in cows and cattle. 
In the northern sector of the arena was a large area of colored flowers. In the south was a large flowing river. This arena had had a large path of concrete leading the tributes around the whole arena, being a good way to know how to get to certain spots if you followed this path. When the tributes rose into the cornucopia, they could see lots of flat area in front of and behind the cornucopia. This year's cornucopia had featured a large amount of food, water, supplies, and weapons than the last few years, making tributes intrigued to the cornucopia, thinking this may be their only source of supplies. After the tributes got a good look around them, the countdown started from 60. Brisquet had stood on a southeastern podium next to Spear from 1 and Calamari from 4. She looked between the cornucopia and the lands behind her before the gong sounded. Once the gong sounded, Brisquet sprinted forward, finding herself fighting for her weapons and supplies. Brisquet had gone in for a bottle of water, fighting over this bottle with Calamari, who easily knocked Brisquet over, taking this bottle. As Brisquet got up, she could start to see blood s spreading. Brisquet turned to run away, but she was impaled in the neck by an axe thrown by thick yeast from Seven, killing her instantly. As for Lasso, he rose on a central podium, on his right being Tinsel from Eight, while Leathero from One was on his left. Lasso looked all around as the countdown progressed from sixty. When the gong sounded, he sprinted forward like many others, going straight for this year's large supply of food and weapons. He was the third tribute to reach the cornucopia, quickly picking up a weapon with the other tributes inside. He was happy to not be targeted, Cyrus and Eunia, both from two, going after the tributes from one and the tributes from seven instead. Lasso picked up a sickle, sprinting away. Just as he was about to exit the clearing, he tripped on a backpack, knocking him over. Lasso quickly turned to grab this backpack, yet the girl from five grabbed on the other side, the two pulling it away from each other. Lasso had forgot he had this weapon, just pulling on the backpack. As he looked down to see his sickle, he quickly let go of the backpack and slit the girl from five's throat, killing her instantly. She flew away from the backpack, leaving it to Lasso, who picked it up and sprinted away. Sonoria was placed on a far-left podium, standing next to only Racine from six. When the gong sounded, Sonoria sprinted forward, unlike Tritica had told her to. Sonoria picked up a backpack and a water bottle, then sprinted away, all of this happening before the careers got weapons. She headed east of the cornucopia, following the path, but soon going a different way, realizing it would be obvious for some tribute to follow the whole path. Back at the cornucopia, Milo had been placed on a middle podium next to Limitus from five and Palma from seven. During the countdown, his worried expression was visible, him eyeing the area behind him and scoping out any useful supplies at the cornucopia. When the gong sounded, he ran inward, picking up a bread loaf, scurrying to his feet. He ran forward to try to grab a small axe that was at the entrance to the cornucopia, yet Palma had grabbed this before he could. The next thing he knew, he was being slashed in the head by Palma's axe, killing him after a few seconds. When the countdown had reached ten, Eunia and Cyrus eyed each other, before Cyrus pointed at Palma from seven, mouthing that she was his target. When the gong sounded, Eunia ran straight inwards, along with Leathero and Spear, both from one, Digidon from three, Limitus from five, Dick East from seven, and Frang Gag from zero. While Cyrus sprinted to Palma, the latter of whom ran into the cornucopia to get the safety from her district partner, the geese, and her allies, Leathero and Spear, just as they entered the cornucopia, Eunia and Cyrus came up behind them, Eunia grabbing a spear at the mouth of the structure, while Cyrus kicked Leathero in the head, then grabbing a sword. Instead of fighting the f group of four at the cornucopia, Eunia turned around, looking for some people that she could kill. She quickly saw... The boy from Eleven tackling the girl from Zero. She sprinted to this pair, kicking both of them to the ground. She proceeded to spear both tributes in the neck, killing the boy from Eleven and then the girl from Zero. By the time, all tributes had fled, including Palma, Thickies, Spear, and Leathero. Eunia and Cyrus settled together in the cornucopia, planning out some action. Cyrus had been on the podium next to License from Six and Digidon from Three. When the countdown had almost ended, Cyrus looked at Eunia and Palma, mouthing to Eunia that Palma was his target. 
When the gong sounded a second later, Cyrus had been distracted, watching the other tributes run. He quickly hopped off his podium and followed them, kicking the girl from three as he ran to the cornucopia, surprisingly killing her. Once at the cornucopia, Cyrus had knocked Leathero to the ground while Eunia grabbed a spear. He quickly grabbed a sword, turning to the kill some tributes. The only people he killed before everyone was gone was the girl from three and the girl from eight, kicking one in the head and slashing the other in the throat. He proceeded to count the fallen bodies, being of the girl from three, Limitus and the girl from five, Tinsel and the girl from eight, Milo from nine, Brisket from ten, Seedy and the boy from eleven, and the girl from zero. Many of these deaths had been caused by the pair from one and the pair from seven, who were now fleeing to the southeast section of the arena. This left fourteen tributes remaining. Now fleeing, Lasso had escaped the cornucopia with a sickle and a backpack, not using either of these supplies until they entered the more wooded area far from the cornucopia. Lasso took a seat once the ten bloodbath cannons had sounded. He was exhausted after trying to get away from the cornucopia, not taking any breaks for breaths. He proceeded to open the backpack, finding many useful supplies such as matches, a bread loaf, a rope, a medical kit, an empty water bottle, and a water purifier. He was upset that he had gotten such an empty water bottle, but seeing the water purifier made him happy, realizing there had to be a water source in the arena. In fact, Lasso was only 200 feet away from the river, which was one of three water sources in the arena, along with two small lakes in the southeastern sector of the arena. He took a resting break for ten minutes, then got up to continue his journey away from the cornucopia. As he walked through the wooded area, he found the river, smiling in excitement once he had seen the source of water. He got out his water bottle and water purifier, filling his bottle to the top and squirting a few drops of the purifier inside, having to wait an hour before he could drink the water to make sure that it was clean. He waited for as long as he could, opening the water bottle and chugging it after 40 minutes. After a minute of the citizens in Snow Square giggling as he slurped the water down, Lasso emptied the bottle, then filled it again, squirting drops of purifier in. Instead of staying at the river, he packed up the bottle in his backpack and picked up his sickle, continuing south. As for Sonoria, she had gone east of the cornucopia, walking on the concrete path, but soon betraying it as this would be an obvious place for her to follow. She went into the wooded area, soon taking a short breathing break while she stuffed her water bottle into her backpack. While she was at it, Sonoria went through her rucksack, finding another water bottle, a few pa fruit packets, a long bandage, a small knife, which she kept out, placing in her hand in case she needed to use it. After s packing the rest of her supplies, she continued through the woodland, walking past many of the mocking jays that sang beautiful songs up in the trees. For the rest of the hour, Sonoria explored the arena, freezing once the ten bloodbath cannons had sounded. Back at the cornucopia, Cyrus and Eunia talked about their hunting plans, soon switching to organize all the supplies while they talked. After all the supplies were lined up in a row, with the weapons all inside the cornucopia, the group agreed to go hunting, specifically for Leathero, Spear, Palma, and Thickies. At the time, they forgot that tributes could take their items from the cornucopia. They left their structure with their weapons and a backpack each. The duo went southwest, where this alliance had been, walking side by side with each other, keeping their eye out for any tributes. After 30 minutes of hunting, they found Racine from Six who was hiding in a tree. Eunia quickly alerted her to Cyrus, asking if he wanted to kill her or if she sh should. Cyrus replied that he would, telling Eunia to toss him up the, the sword once he reached the top of her tree. Cyrus proceeded to climb the tree, soon reaching the top. Eunia then threw up the sword, not reaching the top. Cyrus told her to hurry, triggering Eunia to throw it higher, this time throwing it straight into S Cyrus, accidentally hitting his leg. Cyrus walked off the tree, falling to the ground, hitting with a thud. Let's get her, Cyrus exclaimed, getting up and chasing after Racine, who was hopping between trees. They chased after her, following below where she jumped. They did not lose her, chasing 
her for ten minutes until Racine had come to a stop, needing to take a breather. Both Eunia and Cyrus thought they were smart, continuing to follow Racine around the trees. While she was taking the short break, Cyrus told Eunia to climb the tree she was in. I'm going to fall, you dummy. You do it, Eunia exclaimed to him. Cyrus proceeded to climb the tree, telling Eunia to toss him up the sword once he was at the top. He climbed the tree, almost falling down, barely managing to hold himself together. He climbed the tree, Eunia watching suspensefully. Once he reached the top, Eunia tossed the sword up, not throwing it high enough. He told her to hurry up as she threw it once again, still not high enough. Finally, Eunia tossed it up, having the sword bury itself in Cyrus's leg again. He screamed in pain, falling to the ground as Racine escaped. Go after her, Cyrus shouted, pointing out. Racine, who was now sprinting around. I'm not going to leave you, Eunia said, opening her backpack to find a medical kit. She wrapped Cyrus's leg in a bandage, cleaning it out as well, causing Cyrus very much pain as she cleaned the wound. The pair chose to stay where they were, setting up camp at this location for the day, not knowing they were close to Palma and her allies. For the next hour, Cyrus and Eunia talked about their respective zone in their district, Eunia being from the heart of District 2, where many majestic and historical landmarks were, including Town Hall and Reaping Square. As for Cyrus, he was from the blocks, where many of the town manufactured buildings were. A few hours into the games, Game Maker Fling sent several types of birds into the arena, with these being mocking jays, mocking birds, and jabber jays. These mutts sang beautiful songs in forte tune, their screaming annoying several tributes. This did not annoy Sonoria very much. She enjoyed their singing, taking a seat on the grass, listening to their high-pitched tunes, letting out a smile when one of the mocking jays had landed on her arm. She giggled as it climbed up her wrist. Once it had gotten to her shoulder, the bird pecked her neck, causing Sonoria to scream, looking at her wounds that had drawn a bit of blood. She proceeded to open her backpack and grab her bandage, tying it around her neck to keep the blood from escaping her body. It was smart of her for covering the wound. If she had not done this, there was a slight chance Sonoria could have died then and there. Sonoria headed away from this area, not wanting to see the dead bird she had smacked once it had pecked her. Sonoria ascended in the direction of the cornucopia, not going to this direction location, just walking in the direction. Meanwhile, Lasso had been hacking away at a thin tree with his scythe, trying but failing to chop down a tree in order to make a small shelter he could hide in. Since failing this task, he took a long hike around the area, looking for sturdy sticks that could be added to his fort which was in the process of being made. On this journey, he had run into a large pack of birds, viewers in Snow Square either cheering at him to kill them, while his haters who disliked him because of his rebellious behavior told them to take him out. As Lasso had sliced his sickle into a few of the birds, the others scurried back, surrounding him so he had no place to run. He muttered a word which had to be censored for the sake of capital children. Meanwhile in the capital, Game Maker Fling had told Tropica that these birds were smarter than they seemed. Surrounded by the birds, Lasso chose to run into the pack of Jabber Jays, which were known to have sharp beaks. Not those birds! Any bird but those ones, Lasso's mentor, Casco exclaimed to the other mentors, watching with a few others in the Dalton Studios, where most of Tropica and Rubius's game's commentary took place. As Lasso attacked these birds, Cyrus Casco winced as they pecked him all over the head causing many small peck wounds. Fortunately, Lasso swiped his scythe around them, splattering many feathers and drops of blood over himself, the other birds on the ground. Lasso chose to sprint away through the empty pack he had made, needing to get away from the deadly birds. The other birds flew after him, causing a high-speed chase around this sector of the arena between him and the birds, soon outrunning these birds who got tired, resting on a few sets of tree branches. When Lasso had gotten to a more secretive area, he plopped down on the floor, laying as he caught his breath, exhausted from the bird fight and the sprinting that followed. Lasso lay on the floor for several minutes, soon getting up to grab his water, chugging the remainder of the bottle. 
not wanting to refill the bottle yet, already using half of his purifier. He rested in the tree, covering himself with some leaves as he took a short nap. After a rest period discussing their hometowns and lives before the games, Iunia and Cyrus arise from the floor, walking back to the cornucopia, accidentally leaving a half-full bottle of water they had been drinking from. That sixth girl is fast. She definitely has some experience with transportation, Cyrus told Iunia as they headed to the cornucopia structure, where Racine had been stealing some supplies. She is fast. We will need to keep our eyes out for her, Iunia said, loosening her grip on her spear. When the pair arrived back at the cornucopia, they were shocked to see Leathera and Spear, both from one, and Palma and Thick East, both from seven, grabbing supplies. Iunia threw her spear in shock, not going anywhere near these career tributes. Not having a weapon, she muttered to Cyrus that they needed to run. The two bolted away, not being followed by the tributes who were gathering supplies. When they were an okay distance from the cornucopia, Iunia set down her backpack and grabbed three throwing knives she had stuffed inside earlier. Are we going to go back? Cyrus asked, picking up Iunia's backpack and handing it to her. Not giving a vocal answer, Iunia nodded her head, sprinting back, needing to secure their items, not needing every remaining item to be taken by this imposter career pack. When they got back to the cornucopia, which had been a relatively quick run, Iunia threw a knife, hitting Palma in the waist, not causing much harm to her. When Leathero and Spear noticed the pair, they signaled their allies to run, pointing to the woodlands. The four ran together, Palma pulling out Iunia's knife and tossing it to the ground as she ran. How dare they take our belongings, Cyrus said, gathering the items the group had not taken. Iunia nodded her head, focusing on sharpening her spear with the cornucopia metal. When her spear seemed to be sharp enough, Iunia had helped Cyrus clean, grabbing the knife she had thrown at Palma and buried in the ground, just in case they needed to use this weapon later. The sun started to set, shocking Cyrus and Iunia, who thought these games had just began a few hours ago. By this time, it was estimately 9 p.m. The two settled down, Cyrus going to sleep while Iunia took first watch. At midnight, the fallen were shown as the girl from 3, Limitus and the girl from 5, Tinsel and the girl from 8, Milo from 9, Brisquette from 10, CD and the boy from 11, and the girl from 0, leaving 14 tributes remaining. Many viewers were not upset by the lack of non-bloodbath deaths, but the chaotic bloodbath made up for this. The viewers in Snow Square would want some action eventually. Before going to sleep, Lasso had gone to the lake, taking a small dip in the water, the cold liquid satisfying his hot and sweaty body. After taking a brief swim, he accidentally flashed capital citizens. Thankfully, many of the children were asleep, so they could not see this accident. After this mishap, Lasso had hid behind a few branches and covered himself with a few large ferns. He proceeded to fall asleep. As for Sonoria, she spent the rest of the day resting, taking a few slow walks around the arena, exploring the fine scenery. She fell asleep with a mocking jay on her hand, tickling her arm as she slept. Early in the morning, Cyrus had awoken Iunia, the pair eating a short breakfast before going on a morning hunting trip. This time, the pair had gone north, where only one tribute, License, from Six had been. License camouflaged himself to a tree, leading the pair to walk right past him, not knowing that a tribute had been there. When they had gotten back to the cornucopia, not getting any kills, the pair set a fire and talked about the other tributes and where they could possibly be. The rest of the morning was bland until they were approached by Leathero, Spear, Palma, and Thickies. The next morning, Sonoria awoke to birds chirping and the smell of pine trees. She got up from her sleeping position, stretching her body around while Leathero and Spear, both from one, had been bickering about who fell asleep first when they had been taking watch together, as they both accidentally fell asleep. When Palma and Thickies found out that the duo had been asleep during their knife shit, they were somewhat annoyed, but came up with a solution that they should each take watches on their own to prevent falling asleep. This was proven to be a great idea, according to the citizens of Snow Square. Sonoria stayed in her clearing for a few minutes, soon choosing to head to the large apple tree she could see, hoping it had apples that were good to eat. She ate all of her food, 
the previous day, leaving her with no food and half a water bottle left. Once she had gotten to this tree, she looked up, expected to see an apple to grab. Instead, Digidon from three looked down at her, throwing an apple which hit her on the forehead. Ow! Sonoria exclaimed, pulling her knife from her pocket. Upon seeing the knife, Digiton hopped to a higher branch, where he could see Sonoria, but she was not visible to him. Toss me down a few apples and we will be good, Sonoria said, not wanting to have conflict, assuming Digidon would do this so he, she would not have to use her knife. Surprisingly, Digidon did not throw any apples down. Now upset, Sonoria began to climb the tree. Wanting to kill Digiton, Digiton continued up the tree, hiding from Sonoria and her knife. Sonoria continued after him, not giving up. When Sonoria had a great view of Digiton, she took the risk of throwing her knife at him. Fortunately, this knife hit Digiton in the back, causing some harm and pain to him. Not going to give up, Digiton tugged the knife out of his back, letting out a weak and silent scream of pain as he did so. He threw the knife at Sonoria, missing her by a few feet, causing the knife to hit the floor. Both of the pair weaponless, Digidon stayed where he was, while Sonoria picked a few apples, then descended down the tree, grabbing her knife and taking it, these weapons and supplies back to her camp, upset with the actions of Digidon. It was seen that as Sonoria left, Digidon started laughing at her, causing jeers in Snow Square from Sonoria's supporters. As for Lasso, he awoke to find a few birds resting in the trees above him, listening to the Jabberdate Jays scream like noises. Right away, he gathered his supplies and went to the river, going to fill his water bottle and find some fish he could cook. When he had gotten to the river, a large amount of salmon were seen to be floating around, Lasso killing a few of these and taking them back to his camp. Now with three fish and a full water bottle, Lasso had set up a fire, lighting a match which sent flames to the sticks. Fortunately for him, he was deep enough in the woodland so no one could see the smoke being made by the fire. When the fish had appeared to be cooked, Lasso gulped them down, rinsing out the gross taste with a few sips of water. The rest of Lasso's morning went uneventfully, him resting and practicing his size skills on a few of the annoying birds. Around midday, Lasso had run out of food and water purifier, needing more of these items if he wanted to live. Lasso had chosen to go to the cornucopia, hoping no other tributes would be there. He stomped through the dirt and mud, arriving at the cornucopia to find none other than Thickies, Palma, Eunia, Cyrus, Spear, and Lethero, all in an aggressive fight. Earlier in the day, the tributes of one and seven chose to go to the cornucopia, needing more supplies. When Cyrus and Eunia had seen these four tributes, they prepared their weapons for battle. Palma was the first to start action, throwing her axe, which narrowly avoided Cyrus's head. Now weaponless, Palma searched the ground for something she could use as a weapon. While picking up a stick, Eunia readied her spear, knowing this would be a good opportunity to eliminate one of her opponents. She threw it towards Palma's head, killing her instantly. As Palma's cannon sounded, Eunia was seen to mutter the word sorry under her breath. As for Thick East and Spear, they had all been fleeing, allowing Lethero to stay and finish his sword duel with Cyrus. The two had a tense sword fight, both swiping their sword, coming close to contact with the other's skin. This fight led to Eunia to kick Lethero to the ground, when he seemed to have the upper hand against Cyrus. Lethero fell to the ground, Cyrus popping up. Thanking Eunia, Cyrus slashed his sword against Lethero's neck, splitting his head and body apart. As Cyrus and Eunia took their weapons out of their fallen bodies, Lasso ran away, choosing to starve over fighting the aggressive pair. He continued on the path to the river, sinking to the ground, sighing as he took off his backpack. Annoyed with the courier's presence at the cornucopia, Lasso drank from the river, not bothering to clean the water. He drank the nasty river water, which was safe to drink, just not the healthiest. If drunken enough of, the water could kill you. Lasso spat out the water, the nasty taste taking over his mouth. An unsatisfied look took over Lasso's face, him watching the fish swim, the next few hours going by slowly. At precisely 5 p.m., GameMaker Fling started an event, having the arena's Jabberjays make sounds, imitating the cries of loved ones. Sonoria panicked as she heard the sounds of her cousins. She ran around, looking for the producer of this noise. She seemed to think her cousins had been in the arena as well. 
She frantically searched, soon finding the jabber days. Instead of calming herself down, Sonoria stared at these birds and panicked more. Many tributes would have calmed down to see the sounds coming from birds, yet Sonoria did not. She knew that these birds copied sounds. How could they have gotten those noises without torturing her cousins? It was unknown to anyone in South Square, but was later revealed by a tribute's mother that they had held the citizens at gunpoint, forcing them to make these sounds. Not wanting to make these sounds, both parents of Fran Gag from Zero had been executed. During this event, Eunia told Cyrus that these birds were not their actual family members, leaving them to stay where they were, not freaking out like other tributes. As for Lasso, he was annoyed upon hearing the screams, as they were of his ex-girlfriend Belinda. While this happened, his face was shown to get red, like he was about to burst. He did not take sadness to this, instead anger. He proceeded to hunt down the birds for making the noises, and threw rocks at them, taking out every last one of them. As for the other tributes, many of them panicked, yet held themselves together, not wanting to attack or overwhelm them too much. The rest of the day went uneventfully for every single tribute, boring the capital. At midnight, the fallen were shown as Leathero from one and Pomba from seven, leaving the twelve remaining tributes as Spear from one, Cyrus and Eunia, both from two, Digidon from three, Calamari and Marsh, both from four, Racine and License, both from six, Thick East from seven, Sonoria from nine, Lasso from ten, and Frangag from zero. The night sky sealed, the peace and silence returning to the arena. The next morning, Cyrus awoke Eunia, screaming at the sight of a large bird resting on her nose. Cyrus pat her on the back, reassuring her to be quiet, not wanting to be found by any tributes. Eunia quieted herself, swatting at the bird who went off to the north. Frustrated by having to wake to this, Eunia grabbed herself a bag of dried fruit, munching on these as she watched Cyrus practice his sword skills on a thin oak tree. His strong skills with this weapon made many citizens fancy over him. Tropica remarkably saying that she would bob for his apple any day. This mustered some laughter from the audience watching Tropica and Rubius's early morning game broadcast for day three. When do you think these games will end? Tropica asked Rubius in particular. He thought for a few seconds, then answering with day five. Tropica stared at him and said that she was thinking the same thing. They were both on the same page for once. Eunia and Cyrus stayed at the cornucopia, not going hunting for the early morning, too exhausted to do this. Instead of hunting, the pair practiced their aim at the cornucopia. As for Sonoria, she had awoken to the flowing sounds of the river, which current had gotten stronger, causing the noise to be louder than usual. She stood up and prepared her supplies, going back to the apple tree where she had seen Digidon the day before. Shocking Sonoria, Digidon was still there. What do you need, Digidon asked from up in the tree, scaring Sonoria. Apples, what else would I come here for? Digidon climbed higher into the tree as Sonoria started to climb. He did not want to be stabbed with her knife. Sonoria picked a few apples, ignoring Digidon, whom she did not want to harm, because she had no need to, for her own safety, and because it was not yet the finale of the games. Once she had gotten a good amount of apples for the day, she left this vicinity and went back to her camp, drinking some of a water bottle she had found the other day. Why would anyone leave a perfectly good water bottle out in the open, she said as she took a sip. Upon tasting the contents, she spit it out, realizing that she had drunken, unpurified river water. For a few minutes, she panicked, thinking this would kill her. To take the extra precautions, Sonoria made herself throw up, not allowing herself to die from poisoning. Upset with the consumption of this water, Sonoria punished herself by staying in the same area, not moving. This was more of a reward than a punishment, according to game maker Anastasia Fling. Sonoria had rest in the tree for a few hours, staying entertained by eating her apples, playing with some of the tree bark, and taking a nap. 
Lasso woke to the smell of meat, a smell he had not been familiar with for the past week. Suspicious of where this smell came from, Lasso walked around the vicinity, trying to look for the maker of the meat. This had been made from marsh and calamari, both from four, who st started to cook some food. Lasso quickly found the pair, preparing a sickle for use. He tossed it down, going to the floor, just meters from the head of Marsh. Now screaming, Marsh and Calamari sprinted away, leaving all their supplies to Lasso, who ate the meat of a mockingbird. Happy and distracted with the meat and supplies he had received, Lasso had not seen a sponsor get floating towards him. A few minutes after it landed, Lasso turned around and saw this, opening the gift to find a bottle of water purifier, along with a note that said, Nice way to scare him off from sea. This made... Lasso smiled, winking to the nearest camera he could see. He stayed in this area for a few hours, only leaving to fill his water bottle with water from the river. When he was at the river, Lasso found it hard to pull his bottle out of the river, it being trapped under due to the strong current it was pulling down. Lasso did not give up, only pulling harder. Lasso pulled to the point that his face was red and his fingers were turning blue. He finally pulled it out, flying back and gasping as he hit the floor. He watched as his fingers regained circulation. He poured some purifier into the water as he calmed his body, now fully awake and ready to start the day. Around 2 p.m., Eunia and Cyrus started to be more productive for a tribute, going hunting. This time, they had gone south, where many tributes had been resting. The pair walked past the geese and spear who were hiding high up in a tree. Unfortunately, Fran Gag could not avoid the pair. He was spotted by them while he was urinating, leading to him being speared in the head while he was pulling up his pants. As his cannon sounded, Game Maker Fling had started an event, which he called the Alliance Ender. This event would have an acid be triggered in the tribute's trackers, making them vicious and wanting to kill everyone they could see, including their allies. This acid had been triggered in Cyrus 30 seconds before Eunia. She seemed surprised and scared to see Cyrus sprinting towards her, his spear at the ready. Eunia dived out of the way, keeping her spear in hand. Eunia hit the hard and grassy floor with a thud, injuring her. One of her specialties was pain resistance, so this caused barely any pain to her. Eunia climbed a tree with her spear, hiding behind it so Cyrus could not see her. This was when her acid was triggered. Instead of going after Eunia, whom he could no longer see, Cyrus ran after License from Six, who peeked out his head at Cyrus, soon running towards him. As Eunia climbed down the tree, going the opposite direction of the pair, not noticing them at all, License and Cyrus had a gruesome fight, punching each other aggressively. License almost beat Cyrus, but he kicked him to the ground, punching License in the mouth, until blood squirted out and his cannon sounded. As for one of the two remaining alliances in the arena, Spear and the Geese, they had been trying to push each other off their tree, almost managing to do this several times. This fight ended with the Geese being pushed off, his bones cracking as he hit the floor, and his cannon sounding. This was the same case for Calamari and Marsh, yet they headed in different directions, completely forgetting the other was there. One side effect of this acid was memory loss, while the other was simply stupidity. And while this event happened, Lasso and Sonoria had been searching for tributes, failing to find any. While Lasso found no living creatures at all, Sonoria found a bird, which he chased, squishing with her hands when she had caught it, covering blood all over her smiling face. This event was a chaotic one, making many capital citizens entertained while watching. The only tributes to die during this event were License and Thickies, all other tributes remaining safe. When the event was ended an hour after starting, Sonoria screamed when seeing all the blood covered over her clothing and skin. At the time, Game Maker Fling made an announcement, explaining the previous event, stating who had killed who, slightly upsetting Spear when she had found out she had killed the geese. As well, Game Maker Fling explained the memory loss, and the victor of these games would be welcome to watch the tapes to see what they had done during the event. All tributes understood this, making sense of the event as Game Maker Fling had stopped commentating throughout the arena. 
Upon the event's end, Eunia and Cyrus had been wondering where the other had gone. After realizing they separated during the event, both of the pair set to the cornucopia, figuring the other would be there. They met at the cornucopia structure, Cyrus only arriving seconds before Eunia had. They reunited, discussing their opinions on the event that just occurred. The conversation switched to the tributes remaining, Eunia saying that she saw a spear from one on her way back to the cornucopia, yet ignored her, saving her for later. The evening was calming for most tributes other than Spear, who went hunting the whole evening and most of the night, annoyed that she had not found any tributes. As for Sonoria and Lasso, they experienced small amounts of hunger, searching for food during the evening, each finding some fruits on either trees or bushes, not having to worry about poisoning since all the arena's plants were fresh and not toxic. At midnight, all tributes were awoke by the blasting music of Horn of Plenty, the portraits of License from Six, Thick East from Seven, and Fran Gag from Zero being shown, leaving nine tribute utes remaining. Spear from One, Unia and Cyrus, Digidon, Calamari and Marsh, both from Four, Racine from Six, Sonoria from Nine, and Lasso from Ten. At the end of the Fallen, a small message in the sky that read, Sleep tight, don't let the birds bite. Many tributes had not seen this message, going back to sleep right after the Fallen was shown. That was not the case for Eunia, Cyrus, Spear, and Sonoria, who all saw the message and slept cautiously, trying to hide themselves from the birds. Thankfully, many tributes awoke. The next morning, many tributes awoke with many bird pecks all over their bodies, blood being drawn from these wounds. Thankfully, Spear, Cyrus, Eunia, and Sonoria had been safe. This was not the same for Lasso, who had had a few peck wounds on his nose and chest. He wrapped these with leaves, helping them heal, rather than leaving them exposed, which was how Digidon from three had almost died. All of the tributes stayed in one small area during the day, not causing much action for the capital to watch. By these choices, it was not surprising that no portraits were shown in the Fallen. At 4 a.m., all tributes were awoken by loud sirens, which were sounded just to scare tributes. Instead of this, many thought it was time to return to the cornucopia for the showdown. This is what Calamari and Marsh, both from 4 and Lasso from 10, had done. Eunia and Cyrus quickly got up when hearing this sound, telling each other that tributes would most likely return to the cornucopia. When the three arrived at the cornucopia structure, they were not happy to see Cyrus and Eunia rushing towards them. Calamari tried running away, yet she was speared by Eunia, killing her instantly. As for Marsh, he ran away. Cyrus and Lasso had been fighting with each other with their respective weapons, garnering the attention of Eunia once she had killed Calamari. After retrieving her spear, she watched the pair fight, thinking Lasso would win. She prepared her spear to throw, throwing it when Cyrus had plunged his sword into Lasso's heart. This spear would have hit Lasso if he was still alive, yet he was not, leading the spear to unintendedly going through Cyrus's heart. Eunia's eyes widened as Cyrus sunk to the floor. She had just killed her district partner. Eunia started to cry, stating that she wanted to go home now. She had grown close to her district partner over the past few days. Capital citizens felt sorry for her, while District 2 citizens were upset, thinking that no tr tribute should be crying when they just received a kill. As well, they did not respect her words of, I want to go home, stating that this was a sign that she was weak, as Eunia had volunteered. Eunia cried to herself for the next few minutes, getting up to go hunting, when she had put herself together. She wanted to end these games to go home. Sonoria kept to herself in the early morning, not going back to sleep once the loud siren had awoken her. As the three kins of Cal Amari, Cyrus, and Lasso sounded, she chuckled, saying to herself that these tributes were dumb for falling for this trap. In the capital, Tropica and Rubius had gone over the attack, both confused by Eunia's axe. They realized that she had killed her district partner on accident, just did not understand why she was upset by this. She was supposed to be achieved by getting an extra kill. As Eunia went hunting, they swapped their cameras to Sonoria, who had been going through her pack backpack, knowing that she had been lacking supplies. Hoping that her tribute would not be at the cornucopia, she went to the structure, happy to see Eunia gone. 
Ionia needed to be gone either way in order for the hovercraft to collect the three fallen bodies. Sonoria had gone forward and went through two backpacks, taking a bread loaf and three bottles of water, zipping these rucksacks and continuing through the arena. Just as she was about to leave the structure, Sonoria had grabbed the remaining weapon, a bow with a quiver of six arrows. Now with an extra weapon to use, she was more powerful than before. Sonoria headed down the cement trail, using this to get as far away as she could from the cornucopia. It was obvious that she did not want to have to use her bow and arrow. Coming to a stop at the perimeter, Sonoria set down her supplies and drank some water, eating some food as well. She stayed in this small and secluded area for an hour, soon getting up to go on a day's hike. As for Eunia, she went hunting in the northern sector of the arena, not finding any tributes. Instead, she found some birds. Eunia angrily swatted at them, then taking a seat, realizing that this was the games and what they really were. Just a chaotic death festival, which kills many every year. The fallen tributes each year could have done something amazing. After the basic rest of the day, not much action occurring. The fallen played at midnight, showing the faces of Cyrus from two, Calamari from four, and lasso from ten, leaving the six remaining tributes a spear from one, Eunia from two, Digiton from three, Marsh from four, Racine from six, and Sonoria from nine. It was shown that as Cyrus's portrait was shown, Eunia gave a three finger salute to the sky. The tributes went to sleep, preparing themselves for a showdown that would go down in history. Capital citizens were excited to see what Game Maker Fling had in plan. In the morning, every tribute awoke on their own, indicating they all had a good night's sleep. The morning went uneventfully, tributes preparing their supplies eat and eating and drinking, getting themselves ready for action. A few minutes before the final tribute, Spear had woken up. Game Maker Fling had all the birds in the arena chase the tributes to the cornucopia, pecking their necks as they ran. Thankfully for Eunia, she was already at the cornucopia, meaning that she was not chased by the birds. Spear was the first to arrive back at the cornucopia, finding a Eunia who had been ready to fight. The girls ran to each other, fighting one another with small knives, jabbing them at each other, yet not hitting one another. As Digidon from three and Marsh from four arrived at the cornucopia, Eunia managed to stab her spear in Spear's back. Eunia managed to stab Spear in the back, knocking her to the floor. While Spear fell to the floor, she pulled Eunia with her. Neither having a weapon on them anymore, they fought aggressively on the ground, punching at each other. Eunia got the final fist in, punching Spear in the eye, having her lay unconscious on the floor. Instead of killing her off, Eunia watched as Sonoria appeared from the trees, shooting arrows at March and Digidon, not hitting either one of the boys. Eunia proceeded to pick up her spear and stabbed it through Spear's throat, sounding her cannon. With her spear in hand, Eunia ran to Racine, who was trying to attack Digidon and Marsh, whom were in a fight from behind. Just before she could stab her knife into the neck of Marsh, she was hit by Eunia's spear, sounding Racine's cannon before she hit the floor. Sonoria stayed hidden at the edge of the cornucopia, watching as Eunia knocked the heads of Marsh and Digidon together. The two boys looked in each other's eyes and came up with a plan. Instead of fighting each other, they chose to team up on Eunia. While the boys jumped on her, Sonoria aimed her bow, grabbing one of her final three arrows. She tried aiming for Eunia, yet when she shot, she hit Digidon in the head, sounding his cannon right away. Sonoria panicked, realizing that she had just killed someone. Meanwhile, in the center of the cornucopia, Eunia and Marsh were having a boxing fight, both hitting each other in the hard. Eunia pretended to throw a punch, not doing this exactly, causing Marsh to duck, allowing her to kick him in the head. She grabbed her spear and shoved it in his head, sounding his cannon instantly. There were only two tributes remaining, Eunia and Sonoria. Sonoria tried running away, yet her spear was no match to that of Eunia. Eunia grabbed her spear and threw it into Sonoria's leg as Sonoria shot one of her last two arrows. The arrow almost hit Eunia's neck. Grabbing her last arrow, Sonoria shot, hitting Eunia in the forehead, not going very deep. Eunia lay on the floor, not fully dead, yet pretending to be, making Rubius and Tropica ask where her cannon was. 
As Sonoria walked to Eunia to finish her off, happy that she was about to win the Hunger Games, Eunia popped up, throwing her spear through the head of Sonoria, sounding her cannon instantly. As Eunia got to her feet, shocked that she won the games, it was announced that Eunia Umbridge of District 2 was a victor of the 107th Hunger Games. Tropica was excited back in the capital, not for Eunia's victory, but instead for this being the second victory of District 2 in a row, both of the games being her first as interviewer. As the hovercraft arrived in the arena, Eunia got to her feet and said, You cannot take them away from me, shoving Sonoria's arrow into her throat. In so Snow Square, citizens were going crazy, not happy that Eunia had killed herself. Meanwhile, in the Dalton Studios, Tropica and Rubius were panicking, not having anything to say. The cameras were shut off as the hovercraft medics got out and tried to heal Eunia. In the hovercraft, Eunia was announced to still be alive, but barely. She was healed partially on the way to Gall Hospital, where she had been rushed to. After her five-day stay at Gall Hospital, people were happy to note that Eunia was safe and physically healthy. For the next month, Eunia was placed in Raven's still mental institution, where her suicidal thoughts had been put to arrest. As Eunia was in the mental hospital, Tropica had to conduct the victor's interview without Eunia, showing the crowd Eunia's kills and big parts of the games, such as Jab or J event and the alliance under, trying her best to not show too much of Eunia. Once she had been taken out of the mental hospital, Eunia reunited with her stylist, Charmaine Patterson, the two getting along very well from then on. Two weeks later, Charmaine had taken Eunia back to District 2, where she was gifted a house in the Victor's Village. In the capital, many citizens were not the happiest with Eunia's victory, yet they still respected her. After a few months, Eunia came back to the capital, having many parties and gaining popularity thanks to Charmaine. Charmaine and Eunia became the best of friends, doing many things together, such as solving the iconic murder after the 111th Hunger Games. Once returning to District 2, Eunia moved into her house at the Victor's Village. It is unknown if Eunia ever married or had children, yet it was expected that she had not. She went on to do many iconic things with Charmaine, such as solving a murder and something rebellious after the 124th Hunger Games. As well, she had a strong bond with a future victor. Thank you for watching this episode of Tales of Pan Am. Pan Am today, Pan Am tomorrow, Pan Am forever. I would like to remind everyone that in the comments you can post questions that I might be featuring in the question and answer in the next video. May the odds be ever in your favor. We're in the corner and on.